Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Banff Podcast. I am Jason Tondro, and we're here for a chat with uh, some authors and developers from uh, Mutants and Masterminds and on a bunch of other projects of their own. So we have got uh, Steve Kenson. Hey, how's it going? And, uh, and Crystal, Crystal Frazier. Hi, how are you guys doing? And then uh, my, often, my frequent co-host here on Banff, uh, Walt. Say hi. I am here for moral support. <laughs> so good. And because I am I am such a huge fan of the two people you were talking to today. Yes. <laughs> I, I'm moral support you actually mean well choreographed violence, don't you? Oh, what's that? You actually mean well choreographed violence. No, well that I can do also, but uh, like I said, I'm 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 just going to sit here and geek out because I am a huge fan of both the uh, both people on the podcast today. Yeah, so, I'm so this is an interesting. Super I, stoked! I've been off the band podcast for a few months because I had to relocate from Georgia, uh, and that happened in about around the end of January. And then I I moved out here uh, about a month five weeks ago, and this is the end of my fifth week working for Paizo, uh, and we are working long days and weekends mm -hmm. uh, trying to get the play test book and adventure and everything out. And and so now Crystal and I work like 15 feet from each other uh, every day for nine hours a day. I know, Jason, I can't contain my excitement. Oh yes, it's thrilling, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, but uh, but it's been very cool and, and it's, it's been a, a neat uh, change for me um, to be working on role-playing games every day instead of just in my spare time as what Steve Kent refers to laughingly as his spare time. Like we actually have any of that. Such as it is. Such as it is, yeah. But anyway, we, we brought you guys on uh, to talk about an upcoming product for uh, Green Ronin, and that's uh, the Basic Heroes Handbook. Do I have that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is for Mutants and Masterminds. Mm -hmm. So what what's the sort of basic gist behind it? I presume this is not simply a stripped down version of the rules. Uh, no, it's it's base it's the same basic rules that you're already using in the Deluxe Heroes Handbook. Uh, what we've done is taken away a bit of the like the like crisis of choice that you have when you sit down to make your first character. We we kind of take you by the hand and walk you through the character creation process. Uh, we take a lot of the math out of it so that you don't you just have to focus on your character concept, and then we we introduce the rules in small bites. Size chunks, one one spread at a time. Right on. And are we still using archetypes as a way to sort of get into characters quickly? Oh, yep. Uh, it's a slightly different lineup of archetypes, but you go through and you say, I want to be an energy controller. And then you kind of define what your personality is like, and then you decide what skill areas you've studied. Like, am I a hot-headed energy controller? Am I am I confident? Uh, right. And then, like, did I study piloting? Did I study, like, you know, how to be a suave individual? And then you pick uh, two to four different adjectives that describe your character, and those provide you with some, uh, some advantages. So there's sort of like narrative tags, and those narrative tags have mechanical. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So, and, and for a lot of players, if they're new to role playing, they're not necessarily going to think, I want to be an energy controller. They're going to say, I want to be like Storm, or I want to yeah. be like the Human Torch. And so now you can say, okay, well, then you're the hot headed uh, energy controller, or you're the energy controller that was secretly a thief, or whatever. Okay. Yep. And we've got. Uh... Oh gosh, I probably should have counted up how many of those we had before the podcast. We have eight to ten of those. <laughs> and it's it's a flexible enough concept that if if people really seem to like it, it's easy enough for us to release more. Is it, uh, how, how big of a book are we talking about here? Oh, uh, 100 and I believe 30 pages at last count? Yeah. 28? The sort of digest sized or is it? Oh, yeah. Hard? Oh, go ahead, Steve. Same same size as the regular M&M books. Okay, okay. So it's it's uh, it's not like a pocket guy or anything like that. No, no. Uh, what else have we got? Um, uh, are there any rules? This is one of the questions folks asked. We posted a couple of threads on um, Reddit and the Ronin Army, asking if anybody had some questions or comments. And and some folks did write in to ask: Are there any rules changes in this book? 
Uh, no, we've we've streamlined things a little bit. I think the biggest, like the closest thing to a rules change is uh, the minus one penalty you accrue for a failed toughness save. I think we call that a hit mm -hmm. or we don't call it a bruise anymore because, you know, it, it could be a stab wound or a you know, burn right. or things like that. Right. So there's a little terminology change, but that's, but that's nothing. pretty much it. Yep. Yeah, yeah we're not. Uh, oh. We're so in, not, other, in other words, uh, uh, the average Saturday night is uh, is called a hit now <laughs> for for a stab or a, or a hit like a bruise. Yeah, <laughs> man, you're having fun Saturday nights. <laughs> uh, so, what was kind of the the idea behind making the book in the first place? Like, why why does the Mutants and Masterminds line need this? Book? Well, I mean, when we initially talked about the the project, the Basically, the, the, the biggest hurdle that we heard uh, for people getting into Mutants and Masterminds was uh, the primarily the complexity of character creation and the perception that Mutants and Masterminds was a complicated game. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we wanted, like Crystal talked about, to simplify the process of character creation and offer a lead-in that basically took the player by the hand and said, look, it's just this, you can, we'll walk you through this very simple series of steps to put together a character. Um, and uh, to really uh, point out the fact that the actual gameplay of the game is actually pretty simple. Yeah. That uh, it has a simple unified mechanic um, and that once you get over that hurdle of, oh, how do I create a character with all of these numbers and all of this math? Um, I don't know how to spend all of these points. I don't know how to build this power. Sort of a thing, but once if you can if you can get over that hurdle and right into playing the game, you can see that it's really simple and very straightforward. Um, so we wanted to have the 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 lead in that basically people could you know introduce people to the game more easily that way. Yeah, I I to me, I mean, I've always sort of seen mutants and masterminds as kind of a middle ground between a game like Icons on one hand, which is super simple. And champions on the other, which is kind mm -hmm. of the ultimate fine grained. Yeah. And and so coming to, from a guy who's who grew up playing champions, mutants and masterminds was super simple to me. It was like, wow, sure. right? I don't need to, I don't need a calculator to make my character. Uh, but but you feel like it has gotten a bit of a reputation for for complexity. Has has the has the Overton window of complexity changed over the years? I think it's shifted a little bit. That people expect games to be simpler now than they than they did twenty years ago. Right. I think people expect them to be much faster to get into than they did twenty years ago, but they mm. still want the same amount of of depth and crunch. Of course, they. Do. Yeah, right. We want to have both. We want to have peanut butter and our chocolate at the same yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> we want it to be easy, but we want it to still be able to model everything. Uh -huh. and, that's another thing that a lot of superhero GMs and players want. They want to say, okay, well, how, can I write up Galactus in this game? Mm -hmm. And if I can't, then I don't want to play it, right? <laughs> yeah, I want, yeah, I want Creeper and I want Galactus. And if yeah. your game doesn't cover them both perfectly, then it's not a real game. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I remember this because I remember when, Steve, you came out with the, um, uh, the cosmic rules for icons. Yep. And before that, you know, you just sort of said, well, characters like Galactus are just really not on this game scale anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and and I was talking to people and they were like, I don't know, can I can I make Galactus in icons? And I'm like, no, not yet. And then the <laughs> thing came out and I and I showed them that now you can make Galactus and they were in. Believe it or not, they, they bought in. Okay, now I can make Galactus, I'll play the game. Uh I find that fascinating that that's somebody's yeah. sticking point. But sure, hey, I mean, if, if that's what works for people. Well, for some for some players, they feel like, or some GMs, I should say, mm. they want to. They feel like the the players, the player characters, and the NPCs need to be on the same rule set. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't. It's a mm -hmm. fairness issue for these GMs. I don't want to make anything as a bad guy that the players can't also make. Now, it's never made a whole lot of sense to me because the GM has a lot more points than the players have. So, <laughs> right. I don't really see the fairness, but. But for some folks, you know, this is a big deal, and yeah, sure. and we can see it show up in other systems too. And I'm thinking of I'm thinking of Pathfinder now. 
Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. I'm not sure how much we can talk about Crystal. Like, have we yeah. talked about how NPCs and monsters are made in Pathfinder Two yet? We can talk about how NPCs and monsters are made in Starfinder. Oh yes, <laughs> good. yes. Okay, good. Let's do that. So in Starfinder, <laughs> um, we don't you don't make up an mm-hmm. NPC. An NPC soldier is not made up like a like a PC soldier at all. You don't. Sure. They're a lot yeah. simpler. Right. And, Steve, are, are you are you writing Starfinder stuff? Uh, I've done a couple of small pieces for Starfinder, so I'm, I'm familiar with the design docs and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. So mm-hmm. instead, it, making monsters is much simpler in Starfinder. It's just mm-hmm. easy, and sure. and and that makes in in today's it seems like in today's game community, anything that makes the GM's task faster and easier, mm-hmm. a huge benefit, right? Because sure, we have absolutely. Lots of, yeah, we. We can't sit back and spend eight hours making an Ars Magica NPC like we used to. <laughs> no, no, I've got games to write. I'm right. A personal experience here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. Anyway, absolutely. So, so, but but to get back to um, the Hero Handbook, so this is designed to sort of help players get over that initial hump. Yeah, and it's it's also got some some useful tools for the the GM as well. Oh, good. Can, can, please tell me more, Crystal. Oh, uh, well. I mean, we we write it assuming this is your first time picking up an RPG, whether you're the the player or the GM. So we've got a a decent sized game mastering section that's got oh gosh six or seven different uh, villains from <coughs> Earth Prime and some minions and a couple of I don't call they're not really full adventures. They're like scenes oh, that you can drop into your own adventures. Oh, okay. So it's it's almost kind of like a starter kit for basically, books. yeah. It's yeah, got like, it's got some. Who, who's the mastermind villain in the book? Uh, Overshadow. Overshadow. Uh, yeah, I remember him. Yeah, yeah, good. Okay, cool. So a GM could just plop down, could start making adventures with just this book. Yep. So yeah, you. Yeah, it okay. comes with oh gosh, Luna Moth and the Battle Brothers, uh, mm-hmm. the Power Core because they're everybody's favorite. You know, power armor goons to beat up yeah. on. Yeah, so, and they're ten for the price of one stat block. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's a it's a it's a basic set without the box. Yeah, yeah. Basically, well, yeah. the only other thing you'd really need is a d twenty, and yeah, I, I don't think we need a whole box for that. Yeah, because uh, <laughs> M&M's never really been a miniature scale. No, not really. Uh, um, even though it grew out of d twenty. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of the the tactical movement, you know, sort of stuff goes away when you have characters who can move at, you know, ten times the speed of sound. You know. Yes, exactly. Yeah, like I remember one time we tried <laughs> to play it on a miniature. It was like, okay, oh no, I can I can fly anywhere on the map in what you know as a as a move action. So why am I? <laughs> Right. Why are we tracking our movement then? Well, I mean, yeah. sometimes it's fun to have the little dolls and like say, "I'm standing here. I'm right. on this rooftop, and I brood." It is. It is. Cool. <laughs> yes, it is. Actually, it, honestly, I think it mostly matters for things like the area effect of your powers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mostly. Mostly. How, how many? I mean, that, that said, it was when I was demoing, you know, DC Adventures. It was great having tons of DC Hero clicks to use oh, as yeah. minis, yeah. you know, to to you know, do demo adventures. So. Oh, man, I remember that. That's back when I was just a fangirl and I'd like <laughs> showing up for a demo. Well, your, your rise in the industry has been pretty, I mean, I'm going to use the word meteoric, Crystal. <laughs> no, I mean, I've been in the industry 20 years. It's just oh. nobody's heard of me until the last three you're, or four years. You're one of those, you're like, uh, how did Kurt Busek put this? Uh, like you, you're uh you work in the industry for 20 years and suddenly you're an overnight sensation, right? Exactly. Like, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I started 20 years ago in high school uh, writing for magazines and uh, a couple of different superhero games back in, God, way back in the late 90s. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's interesting how the superhero, the, the genre of superhero gaming, there seems to be so many superhero mm-hmm. Sure. And and there's going to be more coming. So a couple of uh, games that were out there are doing second editions. There's some new yeah. stuff that's starting to crawl out. So um, yeah, everybody everybody kind of wants their their particular flavor. I mean, 
Uh, I mean, we did it in 2012. You know, we, we were chasing Steve's tail uh, <laughs> yeah. most of the time. But I mean, it, you know, the one thing I did find, though, is that there was a lot of crossover between groups. So mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I play Eminem. I play Icons. I play my own game. Um, uh, so, I mean, to have those different flavors for those different times and, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes it's a, it's a matter of different groups too. Some, some guys prefer, or, you know, some folks prefer different, uh, uh, different levels of, uh, involvement. And, you know, like, like we're saying before, um, I was, uh, very privileged to play in a champions, short champions campaign, um, not champions, excuse me, uh, Eminem <laughs> campaign with, uh, DT Buccino. Mm -hmm. And um, and I love DT. He's such a fun guy. Great GM, mm -hmm. you know. And after the first session of um, you know the ten, we had just gotten through the tenth year anniversary uh, of Eminem, and and we had just all gotten our books. And it was like, hey, let's get a big online game together and let's do this. So DT volunteered to run the game, and it, it, as daunting as that book looked, yeah. it was it was flawless, easy, simple. Um, DT helped us walk through a bunch of stuff. So, you know, cool. while it has the reputation of, of being, oh no, there's so much, it's, it's, it's really a, um, it's really a tragedy of choice. You know, yeah. you, you have so much there. It's, it's almost like you're paralyzed for, for only the briefest of moment till somebody says, no, 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 put this here. And then it all falls into place. Yeah. Awesome. And I, I think, I know Steve and Crystal, you guys can decide if I'm right or wrong with this, but that the. The complexity is only really an issue, at least for me, if you're trying to really min-max the points, right? Um, like, no, is that not true? Like, people think, well, you know, yeah. I got to make every point count, and so they get really kind of anxious over it. Whereas I if think, you just buy your power as a no. I think a lot of it is we sort of divorced the effects from what the power is. Oh, uh, yes. So, and I think... I think that's a little bit of a, a learning curve that a lot of people mm -hmm. have trouble with. Yeah, because they, yeah. they go looking for fire blast and they don't find it. Exactly. They they want to turn into, you know, the human torch and we don't have a power that is flame body. We have insubstantial and reaction damage and, you know, blast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was, a, that was a hero system issue too, although. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, think, honestly... Oh, uh, Go ahead, Crystal. Oh, I was going to say, I think uh, power profiles really helps sort of get over that, that, mm -hmm. like you said, the crisis of choice, the like, how do I, how do I be what the hero, the hero concept I have? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I, you know, in some ways in third edition, Eminem, I stripped all of the skins off of the, you know, sort of mechanics of mm -hmm. the power design and I've been, you know, kind of making up for it ever since, <laughs> <laughs> you know, basically with gadget guides and power profiles and now basic, you know, uh, in order to, to provide, put back a big list of how to answer the infamous, how do I dot, yeah. dot, dot, you know, right. do whatever, you know, um, yeah, sort of I, a thing. I remember back in second edition, you were specifically talking about, uh, if you had this to do all over again, you'd want to make the base system with just the effects yep, and have people decide what their powers were for themselves. And then we kind of see the, the result of that is people aren't quite sure how to make the powers with just that. the effects. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the, I think it's just a learning curve and I think, I think the basic bones of the system are, a huge improvement, well, not a huge improvement, it's still the same basic system, but a more mm -hmm. transparent version of the second edition system. And yeah. I think once you kind of get your head around how power design works and how a lot of a lot of the maneuvers work, I think it's a really solid system that plays pretty intuitively. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, well, so how long ago was third edition? When did you first... Gosh, third edition is like nine years ago, something like no, that. No, no, it can't be that long because I no, just remember it coming out. I mean, you're the one that opened this conversation when you said, you know, that you've been trying to fix this ever since. So <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Is 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 for if a fourth edition came out, what would it look like? <laughs> oh God, we cannot say that on the air. Chris Premis will have yeah, a heart attack. Yeah, Premis will kill us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Well, you know, I mean. If I had if I had third edition to do over again, rather you know, than, rather than uh, 
I, I rather than a fourth edition, which is entirely theoretical and will not be discussed any further. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, but if I had it to do over again, honestly, I, I would kind of reverse the way it ended up being done. And I would have done all of the power design that I did do, but uh -huh. then I would have used that system to essentially build a lot of prefab powers for the core book. Yeah. And I would have put the power design system in a separate source book that was an advanced book. Isn't that what you did in you first, know. second? So, well, yeah, and that's essentially what I did in second edition was yeah, second edition. to a degree, to a degree. I mean, the, you know, um, ultimate power was less of a, it had some power design aspects to it, but it was, it was a lot of more sort of expanding the list of powers and talking about how to handle problem powers and things like that. It was a big catalog. Yeah. Um, I would have done more of, you know, uh, you know, here's a prefab set of powers in the core rule book. And then for the real gearheads, I would have done a power design book that says, here's, you know, pull back the curtain and here's how it all works. And look, it turns out that these six powers in the core rule book are actually all the same power. Uh -huh. Um, because affliction can be just about everything. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that sort of a thing. You know, and then people could people who really wanted to dig that deep could have gone crazy with it, but people kind who didn't didn't have to deal with it. Kind of reminds me of uh, a, like a, a, a science fiction game where you it's like a Star Trek game where you, you give them you give them six or eight you give them six or eight. That's my dogs in the background. They found. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad to hear that it was just two dogs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's Tess and Otis. Where you give them like six or eight starships, you don't tell them how to make starships, you just give them stats for them. Mm -hmm. And in a later book, you show them the starship creation rules and how mm -hmm. the ones already yeah. give them use all those rules. Yeah. Yeah. I just like that you call the uh, the real system mechanics gearheads. That's amazing. <laughs> is, that's what I've always called them. That's you know, awesome. It seems a lot nicer than wonks. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> so, so how long have you been at Greenland? Oh, me? Yeah, you. Oh, uh, what is it, coming up on two years now? Yeah, I think so. I hey. was I was writing before that, yeah. but yeah, I've only been an, an employee for two years now. Are, are you line developer? Correct me if I'm wrong. Oh, uh, yes, I'm the Mutants and Masterminds line developer, and I've also done some work on the age system. Oh, yeah, sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, so as line developer for the m, &M line, mm -hmm. You know, what, what's your vision for the line? Like, what is the future of m and or what's its role in uh, our community? Well, I think for now, I want to finish updating a lot of the material from second edition, uh, like a lot of the Silver Age, Golden Age, Modern Age books, things like that, uh, Worlds of Freedom. Uh, figure out ways to bring those into third edition and show how those have developed a little. Uh, we've also had some huge just changes to the world, and I'd like to build some adventures around a lot of those so players can feel like they're there involved in it personally instead of just reading about it. Yeah, we have a, there's some great adventures for m m but they're mm -hmm. but they're uh, not uh, but the the third edition world has changed enough that those adventures are not quite as easy to use as they used to be is that a little bit i mean you can you can start off the the adventures anytime you want you can play through silver age sentinels sentinels now and just move up the silver storm to happen in 2018 sure sure and the time of time of crisis and time of oh yeah mm, time of vengeance all yeah. Those. yeah 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 um but you want it but there's always a need for more adventures right like yeah, yeah. Pretty much. It yeah. really helps people feel more invested in the world and more, it makes the, the NPCs feel a lot more personal. Uh, what kind of third party support has there been for m and Adventures? Have we gotten mm -hmm. much? Oh, there's, you've kind of caught me in an embarrassing situation. I know there's some good ones <laughs> out there, but I'm, I should have done my homework. <laughs> I, I didn't tell you I was gonna ask you that. I'm just curious. <laughs> no. uh, but, uh, because, you know, that's always been kind of a way for the adventure market to get filled, right? Like, mm -hmm. publishers often are reluctant to publish adventures be on the feeling that only one-fifth of your player base is going to buy it at best. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, that is something to worry about, yeah. And and there's there's a lot of ways to address that, and different publishers address it in different ways. Yeah. But, uh, but mm -hmm. 
please go ahead. In my experience, you know, unfortunately, um, the the third party adventure market for mutants and masterminds tends to be a little limited um, okay. because a lot of third party publishers just want to do um, their own books of toys and powers and um, villains and whatnot. Um, and we see like tons, endless series of like villain books, you know, or yes. villain characters, you know, um, they'll have to be like one offs um, for Eminem, but you won't see a lot of um, fully fleshed adventures. There are some, but mm -hmm. uh, they, they tend to be the, the, uh, the minority of third party products. I think probably because adventures are probably one of the hardest things to write. Yeah, there, and it's it's honestly a bigger risk. A uh, um, villain you only need a single illustration for. Mm -hmm. You only need fourteen hundred or two thousand words of text, and an adventure is eight to ten thousand words and two or three illustrations. And if nobody likes it, nobody buys it. That's a much bigger investment that you're out. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, no, yeah, you're right about all that. And and I think there's also a feeling like. Everyone needs more monsters, you know, like yeah. monsters are kind of this mm -hmm. bet when you're going into the into a market like that. Adventures are hard to write. I think superhero adventures are especially hard to write, right? Because you don't know what the players are capable of. Yeah, right. and I I think deep down every superhero GM wants to be a comic book writer. So <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And, and how's that going, Crystal? Um, ah. not terribly, actually. <laughs> not terribly. That's great. So it's, that's a Walt has helpfully segued us. So for segue, that's my job. Right. You're, well done. Good. Like Thank gold you. star, man. I'm impressed. All right. So, Thank Chris, you. tell us about some of the stuff that you're doing because you do have some comics coming out. I know at least the Pathfinder stuff. At least. Uh, yes, I just handed over my very last script for Pathfinder Spiral of Bones to Dynamite. Uh, so. The first issue came out last month. Second issue in the art comes out next Wednesday, or this coming Wednesday, I should say, at this point. Uh, yeah. And I'm really excited. It's amazing to yes. have comics coming out that I didn't have to draw. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you get to see what other people do with your with your story, which I know is always really exciting. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's yeah. I yeah. love sharing the That's creative awesome. process. Yeah. Uh, all right, so City of Bones is what this is. Oh, no, that's not going Spiral of Bones. Spiral of Bones, thank you. Yes, okay. And the first one's already out. Uh, yes, it came out in late March. Yes, all right. Fantastic. So you can you can go out right now and buy a copy. Is, and, <laughs> okay, excellent. And, uh, <laughs> and, and Steve, what else are you working on these days? I, I, I think we, we decided that you could talk about this a little bit, that you're working mm -hmm. on the, the Trinity Continuum. Um, uh, I'm, uh, lead writer on the new edition of Aberrant, um, for Trinity Continuum. Um, Onyx Path just did a bit, just wrapped up their, um, Kickstarter, uh, a short while ago for, um, for Aeon, which is the first, um, game in the trilogy of the Continuum. Um, and Aeon is far future psionics and science fiction and aberrant is near future you know uh, close to present day um people with superpowers um in the you know um uh, a more modern setting so will this be the fourth superhero rpg you have written <laughs> well it depends on your definition of written yeah, yeah. <laughs> i'm thinking um, i think the silver age sentinels icons yeah. m&m and this one yeah then yeah that would be fun. Well, you so you you are obviously the go-to guy. So um, I well, I'm glad that you know Onyx Path thinks so. <laughs> so you know. now, now uh, Aberrant was mm -hmm. a very kind of '90s popular culture. Yes, really. it was. <laughs> yeah. So so <laughs> you say so you you at least I got something right. So. Tell me why you think, like, give me some examples from it. And then mm -hmm. how are you going to, what are you going to do with that? You well, say? you know, Aberrant was, um, it, Aberrant was a very much a product of the, of the nineties. Um, and, um, it was very much in some regards, a, uh, a sort of a child of the sort of deconstructive trend in yes. 
comic books. Um, Post Watchmen era. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Um, and so I think that um, the the t the approach we're taking now is um, uh, pulling back a bit from that um, level of deconstruction. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. And um, we're looking at much more of a middle ground. Um, fortunately, uh, we have a great um, example in the sense that the explosion in, in superhero media uh, yeah. in the last, even just last 10 years, um, gives us a, a great way to say, what would it be like if real people had superpowers? Um, and we can go, oh, well, it would look a lot like the Mar movies that Marvel and DC are putting out. <laughs> which, which are frankly a lot less cynical than yeah. the original. Yeah. And our, our approach is intended to be a lot less cynical uh, in terms of the, the overall theme, um, but to approach a lot of the, uh, a lot of the more sticky questions that some of the superhero comics are gonna sh understandably shy away from. Oh, um, you know. Yes. That well, you know, d basically, you know, the, the, the ultimate theme of, of Aberrant is, you know, if you had tremendous power, how would you change the world? Okay. Um, and uh, the, the answer that there are a lot of different answers to that question, um, but the, one of the key points of it is that it's actually a lot harder to change the world than we think. Yeah. And also at the same time, a lot easier uh, to change the world than we think. Um, and, you know, sometimes you can't make the world better by hitting things. Um, and sometimes you can, um, and it's, it's often a matter of knowing, um, I'll give you a, a very specific example, uh, that a, a friend of mine and I talked about, you know, um, you know, superheroes have, have, have it kind of easy in some regards in the comics of, you know, they go out, they find people who are bad and they beat them up and that fixes things by the end of the issue or the arc, you know, things like that. Um, I, uh, my friend and I were talking about uh, the um, issue that uh, queer people, gay men in particular, are facing in Chechnya right now, where there's a government pogrom that is harassing people, arresting them without cause. People are disappearing. People yes. may have been killed. Now, if I had superpowers, Right. I would be in Chechnya looking for something to beat up. Yeah. The only problem <laughs> is that amongst other things, I don't speak Russian uh, <laughs> or you know, any Slavic language. Yes. I don't know where to go find these people, you know, apart from you know, tearing up the streets until you know, somebody shows up to tell me. Um, and even if I had all of that information, that would be a major international incident if I just decided to fly over to a foreign country and kick some people's asses yeah. uh, in spite of the fact that they would entirely and richly deserve it. Yeah, it, as emotionally as satisfying as that would be. Sure, yeah. sure. You know, and so, you know, what happens on the other hand when somebody who really does have superpowers decides they're going to do that? Yeah. Um, how, you know, and what happens for that matter when Chechnya happens to have a resident, you know, guy with superpowers Who's going to have problem with that? You so, know, it sounds like you're sort of trying to embrace the complexity. We're trying to embrace a lot of the complexity of the real world, and and say that hey, oftentimes it's not that simple, um, but that can make for some really interesting stories. And you're preserving the sort of root from the headlines aspect of aberrant. Yeah, we're trying to keep. The, I mean, you know, Aber aberrant takes place, you know, uh, uh, several years in the in the you know sort of theoretical near future. Um, so uh, you know, it's not going to be as topical as happening right now, but obviously, it's going to build on a lot of modern day themes. Okay, right on. Uh, and this uses the White Wolf's system. Uh, this uses a new system um, that is called the Story Path system that um, Onyx Path built for Trinity Continuum and is also using for the new new editions of Scion. Oh, okay. um, so um, it's a it's a pretty cool system, and folks who are familiar with Storyteller will see its DNA, you know, in it. Hang on. So when can we expect something from this book to come out? Oh, uh, I think that. Uh, Aeon is due out um, the end of 
gosh, end of this year, beginning of next year. So yeah, we, we probably won't see anything from Ever until another year or two. So Aeon's not going to be out till after Gen Con. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Um, you know, I'm I'm all in. You know, um, editorial time. You know, production is like not my problem. So, <laughs> right. yeah. you know, I have my deadlines, and I know when I need to be done. But um, yeah, but it'll probably be a while. Um, I mean, the there will be a Kickstarter and all sorts of other you know hoopla to make that happen. Oh, there will. There's gonna be a Kickstarter for it to help. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much Onyx Path's standard operating procedure. You know, as they release most of their big game releases uh, via Kickstarter. It does make it a lot easier to figure out your art budget. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so Crystal, what else? Are you, are you working on some other things that you'd like to bring up? I mean, I, I know, of course, I know the, the Pathfinder stuff that you're on, but uh, I know we just celebrated today. We finally finished uh, uh, <laughs> 132 Adventure Path. Yep. We, we just sent off the very last volume of War for the Crown. Uh, they've already got me outlining the next adventure path that comes up after Return of the Rune Lords, which if I announce on a random podcast, yes. it's not random, but if I announce on a podcast instead of announcing it at PaizoCon like we're supposed to, then yeah. I will have a very long, loud meeting with Eric come Monday morning. <laughs> Nobody wants. Nobody wants. Uh, yeah, right. On. But And, and then... Um... And then I'm I'm working on a Starfinder Adventure Path installment, and I don't know if it's been officially announced, so I can't say anything more than that. I'm I'm working on that with you. Actually. Nice. Yeah, and I, I, I remember your name on the outline. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I I don't think we it has been announced yet, but uh, it's super exciting to. Yeah, I'm pretty excited. I they've got me writing a uh, like quirky urban adventure and I'm starting to feel like I'm being pigeonholed. <laughs> uh, uh, involve, but the, the key question, does it involve skittermanders? It, <sighs> <laughs> we we have we have a uh, a skittermander adventure. Oh yes, we be skittermanders, I think. No, skitter shot. Skitter shot. <laughs> <laughs> we be Skittermanders was the working title that everyone in the office was calling it. <sighs> yeah, Skittershot is our free RPG day adventure. One of them. Um, Those things are everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> and honestly, it's actually a really great adventure. I'm going to be running it at Paizocon, uh, oh, nice, nice, for a couple of sessions, and 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 yeah, and it's it's really nice. it's it's a fun, well written adventure, and it's just, it just should be a lot of fun. Uh, exciting to roll it out and see what people think about it. Very nice. Uh, and and uh, oh, the other big system or the other big project yeah, I've been working no, on is nothing uh, else that is probably going <laughs> to come around or anything, right? <laughs> yes, I was. I was about to say the next big project I'm working on, or that I've I've just handed over to uh, graphic design is the World of Lazarus RPG. Uh, it's going to use the modern age engine that Green Ronin is releasing at Gen Con this year. And it's the the Lazarus comic books by Greg Rucka, which are, oh gosh, it is a really hard genre to pin down. It's like a mm. post-apocalyptic noir economic thriller. Well, Rucka's a genius, so like whatever. <laughs> I really loved his run on Wonder Woman yeah. and Cyclops. Right. Yeah, I agree. So this is a Green Ronin production. Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, and and you've turned that over, you said. Oh, yep. Development on the text is already done. Uh, Greg is looking over the, the final text as well. There's probably going to be a few tweaks we make. Um, but yeah, it's over to the graphic designers. We're pulling art from the comics themselves. So yeah. it should be a gorgeous book. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, we tried... We tried really hard to be able to cover like any character from that world, from like waste just trying to scrabble and survive in this environmentally devastated landscape to like Lazari having like genetically augmented superhuman spy adventures. Uh, yeah, cool. And, and this uses the age system that you said. Mm -hmm. Modern oh, age, yes. yeah. Modern, and is, is that system opened up to third parties with a license of some sort? Not yet, but it's my understanding we are working towards that. We're just 
still talking to uh like working up legality issues well and also if you said yourself that the the age system that book is coming out at gen con mm -hmm. yeah yep. so without that it would be kind of hard to really do a third party anyway <laughs> well we've got fantasy age already that's been out for a few years and we've used uh the same system for uh dragon age and blue rose mm -hmm. yeah. yeah okay uh Steve, are we going to get a heroic age? Is you know, <laughs> everyone out, asks? Uh, an RPG? Every, everyone asks that. Um, <laughs> That's the well, you know, I mean, Green Ronin has a perfectly good superhero game at the moment. I don't know <laughs> that they really feel like they need to. Um, uh, I, I thought I thought that they also are publishing um, icons, but I'm mistaken. Uh, well, Green Ronin printed the uh, core book of icons and is distributing it. Um, okay. But um, that's it, pretty much. Otherwise, um, Ad Infinitum Adventures, which is me, yes. um, is basically just doing the rest of Icon stuff. Okay, okay. Um, so they're sort of the mechanical, they're the, the physical production. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, although um, the Modern Age uh, game is going to have eventually... Um, some supplementary material that is going to get into you know some low level sort of weird powers uh mm -hmm. stuff um as far as that goes. And stuff like that steve yeah that kind of thing um you know um that would be you know suitable for you know some you know if you're going to do some you know uh, sort of weird powers games you know you could easily do that are kind of low level supers um or stuff of that sort um, yeah i think I think it's more Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. versus yeah. Avengers. Yeah. yeah. Uh, although, I don't know if the... Uh, I don't know if the argument that it already has one superhero game is going to hold up too much, considering Green Run's got a long history of competing with itself. <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot of ideas. We're, yeah. we're very excited. <laughs> Well, I'm talking to a guy that ran a campaign of your Song of Ice and Fire RPG, uh, which, you know, so then you've got Fantasy Age and D&D <laughs> uh, &D books. So anyway. Yeah. Uh, well, I love that game system, by the way. And I know neither of you have anything to do with it, but... Chronicle system? The, no, the um, the Song of Ice and Fire system. Yeah, that's, it's, the system is called Chronicle system. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, no, I did some of the initial design work on that and development. Well, I loved it, and I, I, my players really liked it too. Do, is awesome. there? I, you, I don't know if you can answer this, but is that game system still alive, or is has everything that's come out for it come out for it? Uh, things are still under discussion as far as that goes. I mean, we'd still like to do something with Chronicle, uh, but we'll see. Well, I made a I made a pitch. Uh, I think it was back when Bef Crystal before you came, maybe. Um, cause I think I may have sent it to Hal or I don't know who I sent it to. Mm -hmm. uh, I know I corresponded with Chris a little bit that I, I made a pitch for a, just cause I wanted to get something. I wanted to write my own thing for Chronicle and there was no license. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I couldn't do that. And I was like, is there going to be a license for this? And he's like, uh, we're going to talk about it at the summit. And then a year yeah. went by and he said, we're going to talk about it at the summit. <laughs> the so. summit is very busy. Yeah. 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 Increasingly more so too. Yeah. <laughs> How many people got up there this time? Oh gosh! It was there? Than ever. Gosh, like fifteen? Yeah, I was gonna say. Um, it's it's about the size Paizo was when I first came on board Paizo. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, in in this in in these days, uh, a growing RPG company is something to celebrate. Yes. Yes, indeed. indeed. Well, have we hit all of our marks tonight, Walt. Did I miss anything? No, I don't think so. But. Uh, uh, to both creators that are on tonight, thank you so much for coming out because um, it, it, a lot of times you got fans out there who are just starving for that little peek behind the curtain. And it's not so much <laughs> that they just need, you know, oh, I need to know everything. But it, it, it really is great when creators can engage with fans and, and, and just give them that briefest of peek as things are getting uh, rolling. And it just it's it means the world to a lot of people. So we really appreciate it. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah. Crystal, you said that every or, or was it? Uh, yeah, I think, Crystal, you said that every. Ch uh, superhero GM secretly wants to write comic books. Yep. They also secretly want to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm happy to open up that curtain because 
I mean, I started out as just like a nerdy girl with her own RPG blog, and yeah, that has led to a twenty-year career in the industry. Yeah, that's super awesome. Well, yeah, thank you both so much for coming, Steve. As well. Yeah, happy to. Uh, we will undoubtedly be back soon with another uh, crazy podcast. We are throwing around ideas for what we want to talk about. Uh, we've considered something about Superman's one thousandth issue. Uh, but when I suggested that we might talk about the way that characters, superhero characters, grow and evolve over time, mm -hmm. we quickly realized that that would mean half of the podcast would be all about how much we hate modern comic books, which is not. <laughs> Wait, not does that mean we get to talk about Blue Superman? <laughs> I have a thesis. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. This sounds like a show in the making. <laughs> yeah. Well, Crystal, you're welcome back anytime. So. <laughs> Love to have you back. We will entertain your thesis here on the show. I know where you sit every day. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Uh, all right. Thanks again, everybody. And uh, we'll see you soon again on the BAMP podcast.